Praise the Lord. Let's close our eyes for prayer. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus. I thank you for your people, Lord, these great ministers and we're just ready to sink in and soak in your word. Oh Lord, I pray, bless everyone in Jesus' name. All this that you put within us, that you'll give us the power, you'll give us the courage, you'll give us the wisdom, you'll give us the love to be able to give it out in Jesus' name. Bless your people, Lord. Make us channels of blessings to the churches and to the communities we come from. That, Lord, this work will prosper in our hands. All the grace we need, all the power we need, all the anointing we need. Lord, grant to every one of us, make us effective in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. You'll give me another amen before you sit down. Yeah. Amen. Thank you very much. I release you to sit down now. We come back to Titus. And we're now in Titus chapter 2. We're looking at verses 7, 8, 9, and 10 this time. And we're looking at the leader's pattern of godliness in the church. We have leaders in the world. We have leaders in the church. We have leaders in the industry. We have leaders in our educational system. We have leaders in the community. Now we have leaders in the church. What kind of life? What kind of personality? What kind of posture? And what kind of moral standing should a minister, a pastor, a preacher, an overseer have? A person is a leader, not a leader in the world, but a leader in the church. What kind of personality should such a person project? Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 7. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil to say of you, exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters, and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrines of God as Savior in all things. Here you understand Paul the Apostle was talking, was writing to Titus. Titus had a great responsibility, not just a pastor over one local church, but a, a pastor, a teacher, a leader. An overseer over many churches in a province, in the province of Crete. And he had been talking to him about what others ought to be. And the kind of selection he ought to make. Now he wants to tell him what he himself ought to be. Oh yes, there is expectation that we expect from the people. What they should be then, the Lord will lead us to select them, to appoint them, and even to probably let the spirit in us be transferred into them, lay hands on them, and impart some gifts unto them. But then, after we've ministered to all the people and qualified them, equipped them, so that they'll be able to effectively witness to all the people, we ourselves, we must not forget ourselves. What kind of man should we be? And what kind of women should we be? What kind of minister? What kind of overseer? What kind of uh, preacher should we be? That's why now Paul, the apostle, is talking, is writing to Tim, Titus himself. And he said, yourself now. 
And if you look at verse 7, in all things, he says some things. If you look at verse 10, at the end of verse 10, in all things, in, um, in studies, what we say is those three words, they form like the opening of the bracket and the closing of the bracket. If you understand what I mean, that you open the bracket like this and then you put some things inside and then you close up the bracket, which means within those two words that you have, on this side, in all things. On this side, in all things. And then you have every other thing in between. Then you should be interested. As you look at those words, in all things, look at them again. Now you read with the understanding that you have in all things. In all things. And then even in the middle, you'll find those words again. In all things. That's in verse 9. Now verse 7. In all things. Now I'm thinking Paul is writing to me. And Paul is talking to me. And then he doesn't want to leave any area of my life. Private and public. And then in conversation as well as in communication, in interacting with my children or my wife or my husband, if you're a woman, interacting with the people in society, interacting with everybody, with the workers and leaders in the church. And it says in all things, it's telling us some things that everything you read within that bracket, this one is applicable in all things. Uh, what, what should be in all things? Showing thyself a pattern of good works in all things showing thyself a pattern a model an example a kind of an exemplary figure that is of excellence and in all things and then in doctrine that's inclusive showing uncorruptness gravity sincerity sound speech after all he has said in all things and so now he begins to list for us this, 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 and if I miss out anything, Paul the Apostle was saying, Titus, remember that you're a minister. You are not just a minister for two hours Sunday when you're preaching in all things. And you are not just a minister for the few hours you are counseling in all things. And you are not just a minister or a preacher at the time when the worship service in all things. In all things also accommodate at all times. That's what he's telling us. You become conscious then of who you are. Wherever you are. Whatever you're doing. Whoever you are interacting with. Because there is, there are those words in all things. And then it says, sound speech that cannot be condemned. Sound speech that no matter if they will bring the microscope to examine the details of everything you say at all times, in all things, in all subjects. As they put the microscope there and they look at it very closely, analyzing everything you say, in all things, it will be sound speech that cannot be condemned. That he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed. That is, he that did not believe in that doctrine God is helping you to emphasize. Whatever the doctrine is, doctrines of the Bible, that anybody of the contrary part will be ashamed. Having no evil to say of you, exhort servants. The servants there, there will be people who will refer to as civil servants. That is the employees, the people who are working for masters, for directors, for, for all the people. And that takes in every worker in the government, in the private sector as well. Exhort them to be obedient to their own masters. And to please them well in all things. Uh, if, uh, you know, the labor unions in any country, if they write this, it will cut down very much the activities of those labor unions. Because, you see, in all things, all those employees, and they're to be faithful to the employers. If uh, the activists, civil activists, if they read this, that's why it's difficult for a Christian. It's like impossible for a Christian to be an activist. 
carrying placards all about and saying we're going to bring the government of this country, we're going to bring it down. Because you know, if you're a Christian and you have a director, you have an employer, you have a master, it says in all things, here is the way you are to act. Here is the way you are to live. If uh, you know, do so get on the streets and they are rioting and they are carrying this and singing all their slogans and carrying whatever clubs and matches in hand, we're going to destroy everything because they feel that this is what you do to change the government. If they read this, they're going to change their mind. You cannot be a Christian and you want to be a pattern in all things. And then you want to be a servant, a civil servant, an employee. And in all things, here is what you have to do. You have to be obedient to your own masters. And if the employment there is not suitable for you, then you quietly leave. You resign and you look for another work because if you're going to remain a Christian, you cannot carry placards for them, begin to riot for them and begin to, you know, throw stones and throw things and then talking against the government or against that company. If the employment is not suitable, you just leave quietly and look for another work. You see, this is Christianity and this is New Testament Christianity. If we cannot do that in the world, neither can we do that in the church. Thank God for deeper life. I say thank God for deeper life. Uh, you know, in deeper life over here, because of what we learn and because of what we read, we never rebel and we never riot and we never show any attitude, whether it's a kind of public riot or diplomatic riot, never. Whenever say, you know, there are no activists in the church. There are no rioters in the church. And there are no people that carry placards in the church, whether visible, obvious placards or private placards. We don't carry placards. If there is anything we feel, we, how should this be like this? We go on our knees because it's the church of God. And we don't have any activist that will, that will influence other people and say, how can we take this? How can, how can things be like this? And then we have those, you know, activists. We don't do that. We don't take one another to court. And we don't say, I'm not pleased with this. I'm not pleased with that. You know, the way we solve our problems in the church is by prayer and by the teaching of the word of God. That's why in our church here, we, we give chance for people to ask questions on Sunday. We finish teaching side the scripture and we say, if you have any question there, you can raise up your hand and come over here and ask. You know, some Americans came to the church. I mean, white Americans, they're not our members many years ago. And they attended a Sunday service. And uh, this was even five, about more than 15 years ago now. And then in the sense of it, I said, if you have any question, wherever you are, just raise up your hand, come to the front and take the mic there. They came to the front and said, now, a brother asked you a question. And the brother asked a question and I answered. I said, you're right. He said, it was all right. I said, you asked your question. Are you all right? He said, it's all right. Uh, those Americans saw me after they said, they said, they cannot do that in their church. I said, that's what we do here. What if, uh, you know, somebody rises up and then he wants to destroy and scatter the and ask an embarrassing question. I said, they will not do that in deeper life. Because they believe in holiness and sanctification. And they're not, going to, they're, not, they're not going to kind of fight the church and destroy the church. We will have confidence in them. We trust you just like you trust us. And I know that this is your church. I said, this is your church. And the growth of this church is your joy. And the progress of this church is your joy. And since we have the same mind, you want the progress of the church like I want the progress of the church. And the way whenever you pray for, you know, all the, all over, all over Africa and even beyond the Africa now. In fact, you know, the church in, a, a, the church in America, the, you know, America is different from Africa. If you go to our church in America, almost any of the churches there, you have my big picture there and you're right 
like senior pastor, deeper life. And if while I'm in Lagos, I'm you know, still the senior pastor over there. And if you go to UK, you'll find, you know, these uh, large uh, posters there. Sometimes you'll find my pictures there. And then at the same, you know, that's the general superintendent. Even though I'm not there, that's deeper life everywhere. And because of that, we trust you just like you trust us. That's why I will tell you, if you have any questions, stand up. Even our young people, the youths, will say, young people, you have any questions, they are stand, and they come here, they ask questions. And sometimes they are young, young people, they may ask me some funny, funny questions. And they have not uh, asked me yet, uh, my pastor, what did you eat uh, this morning? You know, they have not asked me, but if they ask me, I will answer them. They are my children. And, you know, when you trust one another, then we have this open communication together and we can interact together, dialogue together. And there's anything you are not happy with, you know, you tell us. And then we'll uh, so see me after this service. Then we'll see now. That is how we solve our problems in the church. We don't have activists. We don't go to lawyers outside. We don't go to solicitors outside. We don't go anywhere. The church is doing something. Help me deal with the church. Who can deal with deeper life? I said you can deal with deeper life. Except the person wants God to deal with him. So then, it means in your place of work, as well as in the church, in your private conversation, as well as in your public communication, you want to make sure that you don't, you don't have anything like you're rioting, like, like you're causing, you're causing problem in the church. Others who have come before you, they didn't do that. They just, we just love the church and love one another. And that love will continue in Jesus' name. Exhort the servants that they should be obedient to their own masters and to please them well. To please them well. And then it says in all things. Not answering again. That he is not rudely replying your masters. And then it says in verse 10. Not purloining. Not wasting time. Not being lazy. Not procrastinating. But showing all good fidelity. That they may adorn, that they may beautify, glorify, adorn the doctrine of God as Savior. How? In all things. As we look at that in all things, showing that selfie pattern of good works. And then exhort the servants to be obedient in all things. Adorn the doctrine of Christ in all things. In those three verses, those words, in all things. Are both challenging and compelling. No part of the life of the ministry of Titus was to be lived on the basis of personal opinion or selfish desire. His hearers also were not to partially or selectively apply the word in their lifestyle. The sound doctrine which Titus preached must permeate and influence all areas of the lives of the people listening to him. The preacher himself, together with all the hearers, must take, make sure that the grace of God is visible in everything they did, in all things. Preachers never go on vacation. Preachers never go on sabbatical leave. Think of Moses for 40 years with the children of Israel. He never went on vacation. When he went to the mountaintop, he wasn't on vacation. Fasting, those 40 days and 40 nights, that wasn't vacation. The preachers in the Bible, Joshua, look at all the battles that Joshua fought. And look at, as he went from place to place, fighting the battles of the Lord, preachers never go on vacation. Look at David. From the time he took on the Philistine, Goliath, and then until the end of his life, the only time he was, uh, you know, like almost on vacation, he got into trouble. You know what? They went to the battlefield, and Joab led the army, and then he, he stayed behind. 
And he wasn't fulfilling responsibility at that time. That was when he saw Bathsheba washing herself. The only time he went on vacation, he got into trouble. Preachers never go on vacation. And as you look at Peter and John and James and Andrew and all those apostles, well, it was there a Sunday they couldn't preach because they were on vacation? Was there a program they couldn't attend because they were on vacation? No, preachers never go on vacation. Look at Paul the Apostle and look at all the places he went, the imprisonment. And then the shipwreck and the beating. If anybody preached out to go on vacation, I think Paul the Apostle should have gone on vacation because of all the suffering and all the weaknesses, all the weakness that will come as a result of the beating. Preachers never go on vacation. Souls are dying and the work is great. And just while we're here right now, many people, they're dying already. If you look at the back of the book in your hand, that is on the spiritual insight for leadership development, you'll see the billions of souls. And when you read that and you see that people are dying, people are dying, how dare you think that you can go for one whole year and go on vacation or you can go for a month preachers and because of this that's why we labor and that's why we do everything that we do and by the grace of God you know that I'm trying to show you the example because here is hey, this is the life of the preacher I go for, you know, crusade, I go for this, I go for that, and then I'm back over here. And for example, this book you're having in your hand now, I was in Zambia. And even though I was in Zambia, I was uh, preaching in the evening, and then during the day, I was preparing the messages for the Congress there because I was going to send it to the print. And then I went from there, this, this uh, December, this last December, then I went to South Africa. And then we were having evening meetings there. During the day, I was, you know, putting all these messages together. And then I came back, and then we had a retreat. And before the retreat, I was putting all those messages together. And the very day we finished the retreat, I came back, and then I had to find all these quotations I wanted to put in the book in your hand. And then all this and all. And then we started on Monday, and here we are. And by the grace of God, I'm showing you the example that this is how to do the work of the kingdom. And you are, you are learning fast. And I really appreciate how you are doing it. We're going to do it together. I said we'll do it together. We're to be the pattern. And our lifestyle is to show that this is how to do the work. As I told you already, you are not just a preacher. You're for one hour or two hours during the message. The pattern of our lives will either drive the point home. Or it will drive what we're preaching. It will drive it out of the hearts of the people. How often have we heard people saying, your life speaks so loud, I cannot hear what you say. Let our life kind of support what we preach. Now, these words in all things, they're so important, we cannot just run away from them. Let's look at our Bibles in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3, verse 22. Acts, chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 22. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God, referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you, Of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear, What are the next three words? In all things, whatsoever, he shall say unto you, the epistles do not cancel the gospels. All the things that Jesus said in his earthly ministry were still to listen to them, were to stand by them, were to live by them. That is in all things that he shall say. You listen to him. You go to some seminaries and they begin to put a kind of pen knife to cut the scriptures 
and he'll say the Pentateuch, that's for the Jews. And then from Joshua until uh, the time of uh, Ecclesiastes, they say that one belongs to this era. And then the prophets from Isaiah to Malachi, that belongs to this. And then the gospel time, that belongs to this. And then the epistles where, you know, Paul is the epistle, the apostle to the Gentiles. And we take only his words. But God said, I'm going to send Jesus and when he comes, you will listen to him in all things. And the words are still important today. In fact, Jesus said, everyone, I shall pass away. But my words shall not pass away in all things. In 2 Corinthians, I'm reading chapter 6 and verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We're looking at verse 4. But... In all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God. In all things, in all things, in all things, approving ourselves as ministers of God. That means then, in all things, when you're on the road and you're driving, remember you're still a minister of God. And when we're distributing food and you're taking your food, we'll remember we're still ministers in all things, approving ourselves as ministers of God. When people misunderstand you and when this is your right, but your right is taken away from you, remember in all things we approve ourselves as the ministers of God. There is no point in your life where you will say, now, we're not talking, I'm not going to act as a pastor now. I'm going to relate with you the way you, you married something. I don't think because I'm a pastor, because I'm a minister, I'm not going to deal with you at this time. Ah, in all things, approving ourselves as ministers of God. In the hostel, on the street, in our places of work, with our wives, with our children. With our husbands, in all things, approving yourself as ministers of God. And then Ephesians chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 15. But speaking the truth in love, that may grow up into him in all things. May grow up into Christ in all things. You look at every area of the life of Christ. And then you say, you want, you grow into him. You grow into him. In all things. What does that mean to grow into him? If I can give you an example, just an illustration, just assume that here is Christ. And then he's standing here. And then he's stretching his hands like this. And you are coming. And say, Lord, I want to grow into you. And then as you approach Christ, you sink into him. So that you are not seen, only Christ now is seen. And then as you are inside him, you look very small. Because his stature spiritually is so great. And while you are inside him, you are growing and growing. Your love is growing. Your compassion is growing. Your mercy is growing. Your interaction with people, your wisdom, everything is growing. You you are growing into me in all things. That's the way we need to picture ourselves so that you know the way you were yesterday should not be the way you are today because you are growing into him in all things. And then we're looking at 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, we're reading from verse 5. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, but watch thou in all things. Timothy, watch thou in all things. You know when we're not watching, the devil can just take us unawares and just catch us because we're not watching at that time. When you are with your friends, watching in all things. When the conversation is tending towards a negative direction, watching in all things. And then when something has happened that will make you sorrowful and sad, and that sadness might push you to say something, you wouldn't normally ordinarily say you watch in all things. And when you're very hungry, and it appears why is the food getting delayed, and then you open your mouth and you 
you will not like the words that will come out watching in all things and then as we're going you're driving you're a child of God you're a minister remember while you're driving on the road you're still a minister a doctor is a doctor every time a president is a president every time and a governor of a state is a governor every time even when he goes to visit mommy in the village he's still governor and so, if you're a minister, you're still a minister, you're driving on the road, and somebody drives rough, and then you, you know, wants to say something, and or wants to really deal with the situation in a negative way to you, and then you're, he may not know you, but God knows you, you're a minister, you watch in all things, that's what Paul was telling Tim, or was telling Titus, and was telling him, Titus, you understand, you're a minister all the time. And because you're a minister all the time, you're watching. When you preach, you watch. And when you leave on the, when you leave in your house, you watch. And when your neighbors confront you, they interact with you, you watch. When you're driving on the road, you watch. And when you appear to be resting, you watch. And when you're with your wife, you watch the things you say. Because you're still you're still a minister. You know what, if you are saying something with your wife and, you know, your wife is very feeling convenient, that looks like it's contrary to what we learned in the Bible. And then, but she's polite. She didn't say anything. And then you talk and talk and talk and everything is negative. And then you come to the next session. As you come to the next session, the preacher begins to talk and talks to knock everything that you said. And then in your heart you say, yeah, what, what will my wife think about me? Hearing what we're hearing. Because at home, I didn't talk with my wife as a minister. I just thought I was husband. You are a minister, then you are husband. You are a minister, then maybe you are a driver. You are a minister, maybe you are working in an office. You are a minister, and you need to understand that wherever you are, at all times, in all things, you are a minister, and you portray that life of the minister and you don't ever say anything you know when we're tired well, sometimes we'll get out physically but we'll remember we're still ministers i pray god will help us now we're going to look at this on the three subtitles that is this message number one constant commitment to exemplary pattern in all things constant commitment to exemplary pattern in all things. Number two, clear conscience and employee's performance at all times. Clear conscience and employee's performance at all times. Number three, consuming concern for excellent purpose in all things. Number one, we're looking at Titus chapter two. Titus chapter 2, we're looking at verses 7 and 8. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. Sound speech that cannot be condemned. That he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed having no evil to say of you. Titus was to teach all the brethren under his pastoral care. Here, the apostle also taught him that he was to conform his life to the message of sound doctrine in all things. Titus was always to remember and we are also always to remember that the most compelling, powerful words will fall on deaf ears if the one preaching, the one speaking those words, if he fails to live by the standard of those words. And that was the problem of the Pharisees. They say and do not. And because of that, the words, the doctrine did not carry any weight. Titus was willing to be taught. A teacher must be willing to be taught. A leader must be willing to be led. If the preacher is not able to pattern his life after the message he has preached or is preaching, if he cannot obtain grace from God to demonstrate the holiness he emphasizes, he will be rightly labeled a hypocrite. If the preacher who proclaims scriptural standard on the unity and permanence of the family does not have the love, the wisdom, the commitment to cleave to his wife 
for life until death do them part how can he expect that his hearers will have the grace to do what he cannot do what he does not possess if the one who teaches congregation at the congregation to be free from covetousness is himself known to be controlled by the love of money is such able having a such able desire for material things can he ever hope to see the fruit of his preaching in his congregation? If the preacher is irresponsible, if the preacher is undisciplined, he cannot raise a responsible, disciplined congregation just by his preaching. Whatever he says, however sound he might appear to be, if he himself does not leave it out, how will other people be able to follow through? That's why Paul was telling Titus, be a pattern, be a model, be an example. Leave out the details of the life that you portray in the preaching. To lead others to heaven, the preacher must see that he himself is headed in that direction too. The pattern, the example, the model of Titus' life. All those things were to conform to sound doctrine in all things so that he could be a good example in everything to all the members and all the ministers he himself has appointed in doctrine, in the manner of communicating divine truths, he was to demonstrate on corruptness. It shouldn't corrupt the word of God. It should be sincere with the word of God. Everything in his teaching should be such as to make men better, make men purer. And, and here is uh, what Paul the Apostle emphasized in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. Even at the time of Paul the Apostle, there were many that rose up and they were corrupting the word of God. And Paul the, uh, Paul the Apostle was writing to Corinthians. He said, you know them, they come to you, you see them, they, you listen to them, some of them, and they corrupt the word. They corrupt the word. And you know, when people corrupt the word, it's either to cover up their own sin. Or it is to excuse people who are very close and very near to them. But Paul the Apostle said, everything is open. We're stewards of the Lord, of the, of the mysteries of the kingdom. We have nothing to hide. And because of that, whether it's me or Titus that I sent to you, and a team of leaders who are working with me, we have nothing to hide. That's why we do not corrupt the word of God. As many do, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. It tells, he told the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, you will see the way he spoke to them. You will see that in all things he had this sincerity and this uncorruptness and uh, this gravity. The words were witty. Look at it from verse 4. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust for the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God which tries our hearts. You know, brothers and sisters, as ministers, if you will desire that, you know, you want something from somebody, because of what you want from that person, if your mind is so much on that, and what you're looking for from that person is more important than your ministry, your loyalty, your faithfulness to God, and your commitment to the ministry the Lord has put in your hand, you're going to compromise. Because you say, if I say this, if I preach this, that thing I want to get from so and so, he'll not give me again. He'll be discouraged. He'll say, well, you know that that's an area of weakness 
sickness in my life and then you are pointing attention to it and you even made an illustration in your preaching and you know the people know me that that's the area of weakness that I have and you have the audacity to make that kind of illustration all right and what you are expecting I will give you come and get it if that is possible again you know if you're looking for something and you want to get something from somebody and your mind is on the gift that the members of the church will give you. You will corrupt the world. You will want to please men. But Paul the apostle said, we, as we were out of God, to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God will try our hearts. For neither at any time, think about that, at any time used we flattering words as you know not nor a cloak of covetousness god is witness nor of men sought we glory neither of you nor yet of others when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of christ and you know preachers so are you know bent on they want to get this i want to get this i want to get this well in, in leadership we love we have affection but you don't have a, such a close relationship you become so personal friends that when something happens now you cannot lay everything on the line because you know so intimate and so close with so and so and so, in all things, if you're going to maintain that uncorruptness, that gravity, that sincerity, interpreting the word of God, rightly dividing the word of truth, you cannot be so close and so friendly and so affectionate that you well, that's my friend. I know his, uh, you know, I know his um, weaknesses. I cannot talk about that. And then you deny the whole church of that truth because of so and so. You cannot do that. Titus, be very, very careful. And that's what Paul was telling Titus. And that's what we need to take care of in that First Thessalonians chapter two, verse ten. First Thessalonians chapter two. And we're reading from verse 10 here, witnesses and God also. How holily, that's the pattern. How holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As she know how we exalted and comforted and, and charged every one of you. As a father does his children that she would walk worthy of God. Who has called you unto his kingdom and glory. And let's look at Philippians chapter four, 3 verse 14. I press toward the mark for the price of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore as many as be perfect. You know Paul the apostle did not shy away from using the word perfect. And he didn't even think of what will the people say if you are so perfect how about all these people that put persecution on you if you are so perfect i i say to spend so many days in the prison if you are so perfect i say it high about this high about this high about this if you are so perfect how are the galatians abandoning you if you are so perfect how are the people all the people in asia they have abandoned me if you don't have any fault and you are blameless and you are perfect you know paul the apostle did not think about that he said that's in the hands of God. They are responsible for their decision. They forsake him. They forsook him. They are responsible for their action. They didn't support him. They were responsible for their action. But as for him, he knew by the witness of the spirit and by the clear teaching of the scripture that the Lord had given him grace and perfected him. And then he said, I call on the rest of you that I'm developing and training as many of us as are perfect to be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing, brethren. Be ye followers together of me. You know, the preachers of today will shy away from that. 
Oh, they say, in fact, I've listened to some preachers and uh, they come on and they say, well, church, uh, thank God for his grace. Grace keeps us here. And wait not for the mercy of God and the peace he gives and the grace he gives. Just to overlook, you know, everything that goes on in the secret, in the public. Wait not for the grace of God who of us can stand. And then they will say, well, church, although I am preaching to you, it's all by grace. That's not what Paul meant. And then they'll say, it's all by grace I'm standing here. If you talk about, you know, living free from sin, I'll be afraid to say that. Then quit the pulpit. Quit the pulpit. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live righteously, soberly, and godly in this present world. Don't come on the pulpit and come and tell us I'm only here by grace. If God were to mark iniquity, even the preacher cannot stand. Quit the pulpit then. Paul the apostle said, be ye followers of me. And you ought to live a life that will show a pattern. That you'll be able to say, be ye followers of me and mark them. Which walk so as ye have us for an example i pray god will do it in every one of us i need a good amen. amen i don't want my people to sleep on me i want you to be as active as i am number two now clear conscience and employees performance at all times clear conscience and employees performance at all times in titles i'm reading from chapter two Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 9 and verse 10. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters. Would you look up for a moment? This church, by the grace of God, this is, and this is how we started. And we applied the message to everybody in their places of work and by the grace of god we have had that interaction interaction with people i traveled um, for ministry overseas i was coming back and i was sitting down my seat and um, a business tycoon in nigeria here was sitting by my side and uh, while they were sitting by my side, we, you know, exchanging pleasantries. Uh, how are you? How are I said everything? Where are you coming from? And where are you in Nigeria? I live in Lagos. In Lagos, I said, we have never met. And then I said, what's your name? I wanted to take over the conversation. I didn't want him to, you know, ask me for uh, this and that. And then I asked him a lot of things and... After I asked him all those questions, he said, but by the way, who are you? And then I mentioned my name. He said, what do you do? I said, I'm a preacher. And uh, which church? And then I mentioned Deeper Life. He said, Deeper Life? He said, uh, so are you the pastor of Deeper Life? I said, yes. And it was in the first class uh, cabin. And he rose up. And he said, everybody, you know, some of these, uh, you know, highly placed people, you know, the way they act. Do you know what you have here today in this first class cabin? Here is this man. And then he began to say something. He said, you know, you have helped my company. I never met you. But there's somebody working with me. He was uh, like my accountant. And he has stolen a lot of money from me. And then he said he went to deeper life. And now he came back. He told me he stole this. He stole this. He stole. I said, What? trusted accountant and he restored all the money to me and i couldn't dismiss him i said a man like this i will keep him and then i told him help me take all the other people take them to deeper life <laughs> and you know wonderful things and it's because of what we teach that the servants wherever they are walking that they will be very very faithful Another occasion, some Americans uh, came to Nigeria. 
and he wanted to have this uh, oil business uh, kind of uh, work to drill something to do this and get oil and you know get a lot of things and he brought uh, dollars to nigeria millions and they had these two people that uh, they they employed but the deal, the agreement was that you will save these, I think, two million dollars or four million dollars in the in the in the in the bank in their name, and uh, but you will not take anything out of it, and you will uh, you know be working when the project is commissioned. Then everything that belongs to you, we will give you. They said, all right, that was the agreement, and so they were working and working, spending their own money their own income and he didn't touch the four million in the bank and eventually when it was getting near to the point of commissioning they had to go and see the president of our country not the present president a former president and uh, so they got to discussing and while they were discussing uh, you know what agreement do you have with these foreigners what are they going to pay you have they started paying you the people they said no and then how have you been working for them? And we have been spending our money until the project is commissioned. And um, how about, uh, where is the money? It's in our account. And you didn't take anything from it. They said, yeah, we didn't take anything because that's what the agreement. And then the president then changed to the local language. They want those uh, Americans to hear yeah, speaking the local language and said, uh, how are you doing like that? Are you religious people? They said, yes. Which religion? They said, Christianity. What kind of uh, Christianity? What kind of church do you go? That, you know, money is there. And we have EFCC trying to, you know, run after people. And you, nobody is running after you. And you are spending your own money for these people speaking the local language. And then they uh, said, which church do you go? Then they said, deeper left. Ah, Kumoye boys. And you know, the, I, I, went to, I, I went to have a program in Abuja last year, January, crusade. And then the president sent um, one of those uh, great politicians and, uh, you know, came to speak there to represent the uh, president. And we finished on Sunday. And then on Monday, uh, we had to, you know, go to the, um, to the state house. And uh, we finished uh, all the, you know, all that we needed to do, a little exhortation that morning. And then the president said, please, uh, wait behind. And I wait, and we waited for hours. And then we talked together. Because of what he had known, that this church stands for teaching the workers and the members that they will be faithful. And that's what we're still saying today. Don't destroy the foundation, the image that we have laid down. So that the things were built up all these many years that you make restitution in your place of work. And you live a such a life. You don't take part in the rioting in the place of work. And you don't do anything. Else. Okay, deeper life too. They have joined them. They have joined all the other churches. No, we have not joined any of the other churches. What we started with, we're still holding on to by the grace of God. I said we're holding on to it in Jesus' name. And those of us who are teachers in the schools. And those of us who are taking all these extramoral studies and you're having a certificate, you don't buy a certificate if you're a member of this church. You don't contribute money together and then be able to have this. We're not part of the corruption. We're part of the cleansing agent in any country that we belong to. That is what we've been doing. And we're going to continue to do that in Jesus' name. And uh, you know, we, we, we go to all these places and the, that time I was in Abuja, we were to visit some other, other people. And one of the people there, you know, he, after we finished and gave some great testimonies and uh, the journalists were there. And while we were about to leave, uh, she said she wanted to give, uh, that's the director of that, uh, you know, of that uh, ministry, wanted to give me a large amount of money. 
And then I said, please, before you give me, does the government accept that? Does the government make allowance for that? So that you don't get into trouble by, you know, giving me. I don't want, uh, you know, anybody to investigate you and then discover that you gave a pastor so and so this amount. Of, oh, you said, yes, uh, the government makes allowance for that. I said, all right. Then after I came, I gave it to the church. It's not nothing personal. And you see, we ought to behave in such a way that everything is very open. Everything is very clear and very clean. That the servants, it says in that verse 9, exhort them to be obedient unto their own masters. And if it is like that in the world, I about in the church, we have employees in the church who work full time in the church. And we have leaders over them who are also full time. And if those who are working in the world, if they are to be obedient to their masters in the world, even to those masters who are forward, who are bad, who are not doing well, and they're still to do their work in all faithfulness and sincerity, how much more the employees in the church, in the state, at the headquarters, in the nations, that you are there on time, and then you do all your work faithfully, and even if the pay is not what you expect, and by the way, even though I, when I was preaching, I said maybe we're just paying peanuts. If you look at the salary scale here in Nigeria, it compares even with those who are working, I would even say working in banks, compares favorably before, because we fix our salaries in such a way. We have medical allowance, we have this, we have that, we have that. And sometimes when we disengage some people, after disengaging them, a brother we just disengaged recently. We gave him almost one million, almost eight, I think 800,000 extra. Apart from the calculations of what he merited. We also gave him almost one million because of his health condition. And we said, you'll need medical attention. Take this extra one, 800,000 and take care of, you know, your medical bills. Because we saw he couldn't function again properly in the things he, wanted to, he ought to do. And so, if you are working in the church on full time, you will not be going to people in the districts or going to people in the church and begging. And acting as if the church is not doing anything. You can't do that. That's unfaithfulness. You are getting something much more than what they get outside. And, you know, we need these are leaders in the church. They ought to know. In Lagos here, yeah, we have many of our full-time workers now that have land and they're building. Because there's allowance to, for them to borrow money from the church at no interest. To build for their families. And if the church is doing that, what, what else are they doing in the world? The church is doing everything that we need to do. And so the employees must understand that since this is what we're doing. And this is how we're helping. And we have to bring it to the open to make the teaching very clear. So that they, you know, the workers, the leaders, say, I don't think that the full-time workers in the church are suffering. No, you're not suffering. And the faithfulness must be there. Exhort, it says... Exhort those servants, those employees to be obedient unto their masters in all things, not answering again. That means that you will not rebel and you will not oppose. And if you are told this is what you do, you do it. If you are transferred from this section to that section, you accept that happily. And then you do the work you ought to do. Now in verse 10, are you still with me? You have not gone to sleep? I'm not, I'm not through yet. I've not spent two hours yet. Praise the Lord. What kind of preacher is this? A man is getting old, is getting stronger. 
Verse 10. Now, not following, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. The Lord will give us the grace to be that way and to do that in Jesus' name. The servants, the employees in various places of employment and under different kinds of masters and employers were to allow Christ to shine forth through them. The masters or the employers in the New Testament times were mostly unbelievers. A great number of them were inconsiderate and unkind. But their unchristian character did not excuse or permit Christian employees. Those who are working for them to dishonor their masters or to be dishonest in their duty. The servants, that is, the employees were to be obedient, hardworking and faithful. Not only to the good and to the gentle, but also to the forward. In their hearts, they were to count their own masters worthy of all honor. The few servants who were employed by believing masters were not to despise them because they were believers, brethren. But rather, to do them service. All this they were to do so that the name of God and his doctrine will not be blasphemed. Pastors and preachers are to teach Christian men, Christian women, that they must let their gospel light shine in their communities and in their places of employment. And that's what the Lord is telling us as we go back home and hey, you're doing the the Christian work and you're into ministry and then you're working in a corporation, you're working somewhere you must make sure that you're faithful you're dutiful you're loyal you're dependable you're trustworthy and they can trust you with money and you will not touch their money you will not steal Whatever it is, you can be trusted and they will know who you belong to. You belong to Christ and they will know what kind of church, Christian organization you belong to. Titus also instruct and impress it on all Christian employees working anywhere that they were to be obedient to their own master at all times as long as they were in their employment. They were not to riot, I told you that before, or to be governed by an aggressive union. And let us understand that in the church here, we don't have any union, any committee of workers. I told you the other time, don't write anonymous letters to me, please. We just uh, recently were to adjust uh, things in the life prayers. As uh, the brother who talked about life prayers spoke to you yesterday and, uh, you know, said they are struggling financially. And because of having to, you know, adjust things, we had to kind of disengage a few of them. That's all right. Wanted them to survive. And we said, now we're disengaged, not permanently, but as at now, we need to reorganize. So we disengage just those few people so that we'll be able to put things right. And then some people wrote to me. And he said, they are not from the live press. They are from all these other areas of work. I don't really believe that. And then they didn't try their names. They just wrote at the end a committee of full-time workers. You can't do that. You can't do that. I, I think it's because you have not read Titus. That's why you did that. You cannot do that. Even outside, you cannot join together with people and write and they were writing against, you know, the brother who leads and directs the light press there. They said some nasty things that shouldn't have been said. Then they sent that, and they didn't even address the letter to me, but the people who were sorting out the letters got it to me. You can't do that. 
And if it comes to a time that myself here as a generous representative cannot preach and tell you, whether privately or publicly, that this is not right, it's not a church anymore. And if it is still church, I have to tell you public, these are leaders, these are not strangers, these are leaders from all over. And we have to say, this is how to operate, this is how to operate, that is how to operate. If you're not happy with something, I'm available. Come and talk to me and say, sir, look at this, look at this. Then I will explain to you. If my explanation does not solve the problem, you'll be patient for me. You'll not push me. You know I don't walk on that pressure. I don't walk on that force. I walk on that scriptural approach. If I see that somebody is trying to put pressure on me to get something done, then I relax. I say, put all the pressure you want to put. I'm not going to yield to pressure. I yield to love because I love you. I want you to yield to my love. And if you're relating with me, you relate with me in love. And you relate with me on the basis of what I teach, on the basis of the word of God. You're not going to put pressure on me and twist my hand to do anything it doesn't work i preached it i prefer to suffer than to bend than to submit to any kind of force any kind of oppression i'll go through anything to keep the doctrine i teach and so when things go wrong or maybe you think things are going wrong remember the teaching remember the word and so here is what the Lord is telling us and telling Titus to be obedient to their masters at all times. As long as they are in that employment, they were not to riot or to be governed by any aggressive union, but to please their own masters well in all things at all times. Their greatest desire should not be higher pay, but adorning the doctrine of God our Savior, not purloining Christian employees, would not deliberately produce less than they are capable of. For that will be considered unfaithful, unchristlike on their part, in all things, at all times, under all conditions, with good and forward masters, with Christian employees, em employers, and unchristian employers, we who are in their employment, as to so live and so work, that they will draw those employers and co-workers to Christ through righteous attitude and through righteous behavior and dedication to their work. Point number three. In point number three, we have consuming concern for excellent purpose in all things. Consuming concern for excellent purpose in all things. We're looking at uh, Titus chapter 2. We're looking at the latter part of verse 8 and the latter part of verse 10. Latter part of verse 8, it says that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, have been no evil to say of you. That's why we live right. That nobody, anybody watching your action, anybody watching your productivity, your lifestyle in that place of work will not have anything negative to say about you. And not a part of verse 10. That they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things that they, all those employees, all those workers may adorn the doctrine of Christ and the doctrine of God in all things, latter part of verse 5. And to be obedient to their own husbands. Why? That the word of God be not blasphemed. The goal, the motive, the purpose, the reason for our action. That goal is very important to God. It's not just the action, but the reason for the action. And the purpose of the action, the motivation of that action. Our actions are evaluated on the basis of the purpose behind those actions. 
For all the children of God and the ambassadors of Christ, our consuming purpose and passion should be to glorify God and to influence and inspire others to also glorify Him. Our relationships, our behavior, our activities, our manner of life, our mode of working should make all around us desire Christ and desire salvation. At home, we should so live that the word of God will not be blasphemed. That's Titus chapter 2 verse 5. In the community, our conduct should show such a model of righteousness that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, not having any evil thing to say of you. We read that already, Titus chapter 2 verse 8. With our employers and among our fellow workers. Whether you're employed in the church or you're employed outside the church. Whether you're in the lower cadre or you're in the higher rung of the ladder. Our, with our employers and with all those fellow workers in the midst of other employers. Our lifestyle and dedication in service, our faithfulness and loyalty, our honesty and integrity, our attitude and industry, our skillfulness and selflessness, our resourcefulness, everything should go a long way to make us adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. Let's look at First Timothy chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 1. First Timothy chapter 6. And we're looking at verse 1. In First Timothy chapter 6 verse 1. Here is the commandment. Here is the word. The exhortation the Lord has given us. Let as many servants. Civil servants. Employees. Let as many servants. As a under the yoke that's under the control, under the authority of their of their master, the yoke of their under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, worthy of all honor. If we're real Christians, we will honor our employers. We will honor the people who are giving us work. And that honor will show in attitude. And then those of us who are not on full time will walk us through. And there will be that honor that you understand that, you know, here is a ministry. Here is a minister. And the Lord is using this minister to provide ministry for you. And there will be that honor. Yeah, there will be no stubbornness or insubordination. Look at it yourself. If you are still a Bible Christian. And if this is still a Bible church. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters. Worthy of all honor that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. God will help us. I need a good amen. Amen. You know, I, I need to know that you are in agreement. I know you are in agreement. You, you know, sometimes the doctor comes and he has uh, this, uh, you know, knife in the hand. He's preparing it and, you know, putting it in this way and this way. You say, doctor, what are you trying to do? And the doctor says, I need to cut you. I need to cut something out of you. Because, you know, there's a, there's a degenerating part of your flesh. That if we don't cut it off, it's going to affect your life. And that's what we're doing. Sometimes the sword of the spirit the word of God and you have to sharpen it very well and some things that are extraneous things that are coming into our lives into our lives in our employment into our lives in church service we need to cut them off and when we're doing that it may not all be smiles but the grace of God will see us through and we'll become better for it when all those things are taken away and we'll become real children of God that are standing standing on this eternal unchanging infallible truth of the watch of God 
the Lord will give us grace to do what is right in Jesus' name. We're looking at First Peter chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 12. Having your conversation honest among Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evil doers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God. God in the day of visitation. Now in verse 13, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. For the Lord's sake. For the Lord's sake. For the Lord's sake. Submit yourself to every ordinance of man, whether it be to the king as supreme or to governors, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evil doers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that was well doing. Ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Matthew chapter 5 verse 16. Matthew chapter 5 verse 16. Here are the words of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, Matthew 5. And here we're reading verse 16. It says, let your light so shine. Is that possible today? Amidst the corruption and the putrefaction in the system, in the society, that will become so totally different that our church is different from all these assemblies that are rising up, that, you know, people that there's no, that there's no teaching of the word of God, there's no obedience to the word of God, that we can be very different. As we look at, you know, all the other people who say they're Christians and they're working in all these other corporations and companies and government houses and they're working in different, different places and you see the life they live that you will make sure that you're different the grace of god shining through you and the spirit of god making you to be spectacular exemplary and excellent worker that you let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and then they'll glorify who they'll glorify your father who is in heaven that's what we are going to do we're going to rise up and we're going to pray to the Lord. We're going to say, yes, Lord, if you're a Christian, I'm sure you're a Christian and you're a minister of God, you're a worker in the vineyard of the Lord and look at all the correction the Lord is bringing away. And if you're a full-time worker in the vineyard, didn't I say everybody should stand up? Thank you, I appreciate your standing up. And as we stand up and we're saying, oh Lord, here is the standard of your word. Help us, Lord, to keep to this standard. I want to hear you pray and you talk to the Lord saying, Lord, yes, we will. Yes, we will. Yes, we will. And the glory of the gospel and the shining light of the gospel that the Lord has given us in this church, we uplift it, we uphold it, and we're still standing by it. And we're not going to allow the pressure of the world around us and the pressure of all the other churches around us the way they do. We're not going to allow that to make us irresponsible. We're not going to allow that to make us unscriptural. We're not going to allow that to make us ordinary. We're going to carry out the will of God and the word of God in the way it ought to be carried out. We give ourselves to the Lord and lay everything upon the altar once again. And we say, Lord, here we are, clear us, wash us, brush all those things that should not be in our lives, brush everything away and you don't, you don't want to silence your pastor you don't want to silence your preacher you don't want to silence your overseers, you don't want to say why is he talking like that you cannot determine what the preaching should be the word of God is the word of God. And we need to be faithful to that word of God. You stand by that word. And you don't want to kind of have the culture of, you know, disobedience and uphold that and uplift that and exalt that. And all of us who are working together, I've been talking to some of the sectional leaders, talk to the people under your section that we agree with this word of God and carry out this word of God and live by this word of God so that we exalt obedience, we exalt submission to the word and we show that we have the grace of God in our lives. I pray and tell the Lord 
that God will help you. You'll be your best. You'll be your best. You'll be your best in the work of God. In the kingdom. Be a pattern. Be a model. Be an example. Encourage others to live according to the standard of the Bible. Let there be some improvement in your attitude to the word of God. Not joining rioters, activists, petition writers, Sound in the word. Sound in the faith. Committed to obedience. Yielded to the teaching of the word of God. Submissive to the scripture. That's why you're a Christian. That's why you're a minister. Taking joy as you see other people obeying the word. Not taking joy as you see others rebelling against the word. Bringing your neck under the yoke of Christ in submission to the word of the Lord. Demonstrating Christian character, Christian humility, Christian love. Demonstrating the fruit of the Spirit. In your place of work. Faithfully doing your duty. Hard work. Industry. Skillfulness. Faithfulness. Loyalty. Dependability. Trustworthiness in your place of work. Be a shining example so that other workers who are there who will go to other churches they will see the standard that they have not seen in their own churches they will see it in your life your humility your submission your cooperation your devotion your obedience and in the church as full-time workers if you are transferred from one section to the other your obedience your submission not wanting to pull the roof down tear the church apart just because you are transferred from one section to the other and if we can transfer full-time workers, I have a part-time workers, you are the choir, you are transferred to another section, why not? We bomb the church, tear everything down because you are transferred from one section to the other. You are an usher, you are in the security, you are transferred from being an usher, you are transferred to another place. We we'll tear the church apart because we transfer you, part-time worker. If we transfer full-time workers, can't we transfer you? What's a big deal? You're working in the children's section. You're transferred to another section. What's, what's the crime? 
you're on the campus, you're in the youth section, you're transferred to another place. What's the big deal? We even transfer our state overseers. And the whole state does not, they don't rebel. We transfer our region overseers. We transfer our missionaries. And those nations still keep on going. If we transfer full-time workers, missionaries, overseers, why can't we transfer? Those who are working in different sections. And we can still remain Christians, loyal to the Lord, faithful to the Lord, committed to the work he has given us to do. Are you in that section because of that person that was transferred? Is your God, you are worshipping him. And because when he's absent, then your God is gone. And let, let's have an understanding of the Bible. And follow through on obedience to the word of God. Without fear, without favor. Commit yourself to the Lord, that the Lord will help you, that the Lord will cleanse the church, that the Lord will make us the kind of people we ought to be. No rebellion, just righteousness. Yieldedness, obedience and submission to the word. And you will be an encouragement to other people that they should make Jesus the Lord, the master, and the king. You don't want anybody to exalt you above Christ. You don't want anybody to dishonor God because they're trying to defend you. In Jesus' name we pray. Don't go to sleep. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father, we thank you at this time. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for your words. Thank you for the liberty to read the Bible. And thank you, Lord, for the liberty to preach it as it ought to be preached. Thank you, Lord, for a church like this that we can declare the word of God without fear, without favor. Thank you, Lord, for your people receiving the word of God and wanting to live by the word. I pray that your blessing will come upon your people in Jesus' name. And we pray that your glory will never depart from this church. Will never depart from every family. Will never depart from every minister. Will never depart from every worker. And this work will prosper in our hands in Jesus' name. When we are challenged or corrected or reproved or rebuked, Lord, we want to see the grace in our lives. The grace that will show that we belong to you. And that grace will make us to plant our feet solidly on the rock of ages that that rebuke or correction or reproof will not make us unfaithful in the work of the Lord in Jesus' name. But there will be joy. Let a righteous man smite me. It shall be ointment upon my head. Oh Lord, we want to see that joy of faithful children. We want to see that joy of loyal ministers. When things are corrected, that we're happy that God can raise up a leader, a father in the Lord to challenge us and get those things corrected. And then we'll walk in love. And we'll walk in unity. And we'll walk with more loyalty. And with more faithfulness in Jesus. Jesus name we pray Lord that tonight as we have had all this you help us recollect in our places of work whether in the church or outside the church how things have been and to put things right and to react in a proper way to respond in a proper way so that your blessing will rest upon every one of us in Jesus name make us patterns indeed models indeed a good examples indeed that lord will show the light to all the people around us and lord as we rest tonight we'll pray that any strength physical strength what we have lost will regain everything before tomorrow morning and then we come back full of life and full of energy and wanting to move on in the things of the lord once again lord in jesus name 
We pray, Lord, where we need to correct things, make restitution, set our ways right. Help us, Lord, to be yielded to you. After all, I've been made, made restitution. I'd never heard about that doctrine before. The moment you spoke to him, he woke up early in the morning and he did the rising. Give us that kind of heart, that kind of attitude that will say, if we have done things that were wrong before, we'll not do that anymore. And then you purge, purify, cleanse us, and give us, Lord, that heart that will worship in the beauty of holiness. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus... I'm so excited today because God has been so faithful to me. I'm going to keep this very short. First of all, I want to thank God for the church. The church has been my family. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Dada. He has been a father to me. I don't start crying. Okay, um, I remember I came here without um, scholarship to Harvard University. The first year wasn't easy, but I got a grant that paid half of my tuition. But then from second year, I got like five different scholarships from my department. I just thank God. Third year, the same thing. And I thank God because I'll be graduating in May. I didn't have to stay out for a I just thank God for all this provision. I just bless you. Praise 